It's a virus that we know that's out in the environment each and every year. Uh, and fortunately, it's much like the human flu virus is the fact that it has the ability to to change over the season and certain times certain years it becomes more pathogenic more detrimental to us than it is other years and so this HPAI episode we've seen it coming as far in Europe uh, all last summer and, and the detriment that it was having over there coming up through Canada down through and so it, it was it was building up to be one of those those years that we were kind of looking forward to, looking out for, I guess I should say. Um, but it is. It's a highly infectious uh, virus uh, that does affect our domestic birds. It does affect wildlife. Uh, wildlife are infected. Now, a lot of times we will see those birds being asymptomatic or without symptoms. Um, but it does. it is highly impactful to our domestic birds, such as chicken, turkeys, geese, uh, pheasant, quail. So we know that all of the the products that a bird produces that is that is infected is has infected viruses within it, as well as it is aerosolized or it can be it's breathed in and out, and so we will get see it in the environment through the air as well. So it can spread through that direct contact as well as through the air. It was a, a backyard flock, uh, what we consider backyard flock. It was non-commercial. Um, it was a mixed species, so they did have uh, ducks, geese, turkeys, chickens as well. Um, and we've, we've diagnosed it in several, I shouldn't say wildlife services, has diagnosed it in several wildlife occasions. Um, so it was just, we know it's there. We, we have to assume it's out there, but yeah, it did unfortunately get into one of our domestic flocks in the eastern central Kansas. Symptoms that we would associate with being flu, uh, meaning that they, it's a respiratory issue. Uh, the thing that the folks that have had it, unfortunately, that the first thing they talk about is they walk into the coop and it's just eerily quiet. The, the birds are depressed. Uh, they don't feel well. Uh, you can tell that they're depressed. Um, we'll see lower feed consumption. Uh, the commercial world is saying that the first sign they're seeing is a dramatic decrease in water consumption. So they're seeing these birds really back off. Uh, but as far as individually lies, it's that, you know, sneezing, uh, respiratory distress, uh, may see some ocular discharge or eye discharge. The unfortunate thing is, is then ultimately you'll find some dead birds. Uh, yeah. It is it is pathogenic and, and it is detrimental to those birds. What happened on this case was is that the producer noticed there was issues wrong. Uh, they called us. Uh, we dispatched a foreign animal disease diagnostician or one of our veterinarians to go out and, and make a site visit. We did pull sampling on these birds, uh, determined that they did come back positive for the avian influence strain that we're dealing with today. We immediately put a quarantine on that facility and responded and and um, went out. Unfortunately, the, the, the ramifications of there is we had to destroy all of those birds that were on site and, and properly dispose of them. Um, that facility now is under a quarantine and, and we'll have to do some cleaning and, and that will probably have to stay out of the poultry business for probably six months so that we can make sure this virus is eliminated from that facility. At the same time, we put a control zone around that region and that control zone is is a 10 kilometer region around there that uh, we're going to do surveillance meaning that we're reaching out to all of the folks that are trying to find all the folks in that area that has birds uh, providing them some education some outreach contact information uh, if we find there's a, a commercial facility within that region or a facility that's selling product off-site uh, we will have to put a quarantine and probably do some testing on them as well. But uh, our big thing now is just trying to reach those folks that's in that, that area. We've had a great response uh, from those folks. We've, we've put out the messaging that, hey, please give us a call, let us know. We've had a great response, and to this point, we've found nothing of, of any concern at this point in time. It's, it's all going to be related to what their individual operation is, but in general is, is to create some separation between other birds that aren't yours as well as create some separation between the wildlife. Uh, access out there. So if you have birds that have the run outside uh, and you have a pond that maybe has wildfowl on it, make sure there's separation between them. If, if you have to keep your birds in or, or whatever the case may be, you know, try to uh, make sure that those they don't have access to common feed sources, that they're not commingling there, that you've got your feed sources protected. Uh, if you're out doing chores, you know, change your shoes, 
use a wa- uh, foot bath, change your clothes before you're walking in and out of your coop um, based on that exposure. Um, but the biggest thing is is just creating that, that separation between your birds and anybody else. If you happen to be buying birds, make sure they're coming from an MPIP clean source that they've been tested and they're certified to be clean. If you're showing birds or moving birds for some reason, um, you know, create a quarantine facility to where you can separate those birds before you put them in your general population for a period of time. So again, it's a lot of the same stuff we talk about and the fact of just creating that that barrier, uh, whether it's real or whether it's, it's it's by operations that you you separate that. You know, our commercial facilities is making sure that they're not sharing equipment and that they are. Um, you know, unfortunately, the droppings from these wildlife are teeming with virus. And so, you know, if you allow your dog to go out and, and run around the pond and then he comes up and gets in the chicken coop he has the capability of being a vector a mechanical vector and pulling that in so it's just being cognizant of what what exposure there is when we talk about it, it it's primarily the wild waterfowl um, there's there's no indications why other birds can't be infected but right now it, we know it's the wild waterfowl we are seeing some impact on some vec- some raptors or, or the hawks and that because they're feeding on some of these 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 carcasses don't want to incriminate the wildlife by any nature, but it's just the nature of the game, and that's that's uh, that's the issues. But yeah, creating that separation. Frankly, there is opportunities for avian influenza to be a zoonotic or being a human health hazard, but this this strain has shown no indication that there's ever any uh, that there's any human crossover in that. So yes, we're considering again not a public health, and it's not a food safety issue on prepared foods or prepared eggs. We don't have any restrictions on shows or swap meets or anything like that in place as of today. Uh, I, I can't sit here and promise that that's not something coming if this thing expands to the point where we have to. Um, but with that being said, there are things that, that having it in the state now and knowing that we have it in the state just heightens us that we have to do the right thing. And so, you know, our plea is to show managers, to, to folks that are, that are attending these events, again, step up your game a little bit, make sure that we're in. You know, if you happen to have a show that's going to be utilizing waterfowl and domestic poultry, uh, is there an opportunity to do them on separate days? Is there opportunities to make sure that we're separating them or maybe not have one of those two different groups at the same show, at the same time sale, you know? Um, uh, but yeah, just asking them to step up. And if they have any questions, we'd like to definitely visit with them a little bit. Um, but it, yeah, at this point in time, we're not, we haven't implemented any kind of a stop movement or any kind of a restriction on those folks. We know, and, and again, from the 2014, 2015 outbreak that, you know, once we started uh, getting some warmer temperatures, some drying temperatures in some of these regions that, that it did uh, kind of self-eliminate itself or the exposure was, you know, we frankly need these birds to migrate on through, get on through, uh, stop creating the exposure there uh, but yeah history showing us that it will eliminate itself as as we get more into the summer months it's still a it's still a risk by all means seeing it in in 17 states across the nation right now um, as of yesterday I don't know what the new ones are today uh, but yeah uh, we foresee that we're going to be through it at least the early part of summer um, again um, fortunately, it looks like what we're doing in the nation, we've learned a lot from the 2014-2015 outbreak. Uh, I'm not going to say it's not been impactful, but it's not been to the point where it was insurmountable like it was in the, back then. So I think our responses are effective, uh, but I think just the ability for producers to be vigilant and, and um, the awareness is, is huge. But yeah, uh, I think we've got a few more months to deal with it. Our biggest goal is to respond to something that isn't there. So uh, we would like them to give us a call, let us visit with them a little bit. If, if you have more uh, ability to call your veterinarian, please call them as well. But yes, we most definitely would like you, like our folks to reach out to us and, and let us visit with them. We have our website there and agriculture.ks.gov backslash avian influenza is our page. Uh, likewise, we also have a 1-800 number available out there. Uh, we would like people to call in. That's 833-765-2006.